Let's go. And Ali has assigned me the peacekeeping occupation of this district. I took care of the generator. How's the raid going? We should have sent Agent Navarre. Your brother is timid like a child. Did something go wrong? Deus Ex, a game whose title I need to be sure to pronounce slowly to make sure it doesn't sound like Brainchild of game director Warren Spector, known for his work on Epic Mickey and System Shock, the latter's game design almost coming off as a prototype for Spector's eventual conspiracy simulator, was a huge deal for the market of first-person RPGs. Now, 20 years later, first-person RPGs are a little vague and can mean a lot of different things. While you have your arguably more traditional RPGs in the form of Fallout and Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, all that stuff, Deus Ex was the first game to coin the term immersive sim, which is sort of a subgenre of first-person RPGs. It's more so a first-person RPG with a large emphasis on player choice, where the player's choices and actions can influence the direction of the game. System Shock 1 and 2, Bioshock, basically any game that ends with shock, those are all immersive sims. And Deus Ex, at least the original, still seems to be the peak of what this subgenre is capable of. Prey 2017 came pretty close, not to be mistaken with Prey 2006, that's a completely different game, but yeah, 2000's Deus Ex, you're gonna see this game at the top of a lot of people's best games of all times list. And honestly, it's a contender for one of mine as well. There's a reason why people say every time you mention Deus Ex, someone's gonna re install it, and hey, hopefully by the end of this video you'll understand. Deus Ex is another one of my favorite franchises of all time, up there with the likes of Mega Man and Metroid, but between the three, one sticks out like a sore thumb, where Mega Man is a fast-paced platformer shooter and Metroid is a dark and dreary exploration game, Deus Ex is an epic with a heavy focus on stealth, replayability, role-playing, combat, witty one-liners, and bombs. And the man we have to thank for allowing Spectre's masterpiece to exist in the first place is none other than the doomer boomer of gamers past, John Romero. See, after Romero was booted out of id Software for contributing next to nothing for Quake 1 and spending the whole time in chat rooms deathmatching with fans, he went out and founded his own gaming studio that pumped out classics like the topic of today's video, Thief, and... <laughs> After Romero set his sights on Warren Spector, who had been trying to pitch his dream game to devs across the world, originally titled Troubleshooter, Romero hired him on, gave him a team, and all the funds that he would need to let Spector pursue his dream of a cyberpunk adventure where nearly every conspiracy theory imaginable at the time was real. Government corruption at the highest level, the Illuminati running the world, aliens, Area 51, Roswell, the Majestic 12, and all of this being forced onto our protagonist, sunglasses aficionado J.C. Denton. Not exactly a blank slate for the player, but close enough to allow them to express themselves in this dark and dreary near-future world that Spectre and his team put together. While Deus Ex presents itself as a first-person shooter, it's very much an RPG first and an FPS second. If you don't have any XP points put into your weapon skills, your aim is going to be worse than Romero's marketing team. You need to spec into the right type of playstyle you want from this game. If you want to go on guns blazing, you can, you just need to spec into the right weapon skills. But as a result, you might be missing out on other perks like the ability to hack computers, hack keypads, and lockpick skills that allow for a stealthier playstyle that can completely bypass firefights. I personally like to play a mix of both, a mostly stealth-based build but packed with enough gear just in case I need to go on loud. The AI isn't exactly what I'd consider intelligent. You'll be called out for walking into the ladies' restroom, but as long as you're crouching, you're borderline invisible to these guys unless they look right at you. Deus Ex also prides itself on its replayability, and I couldn't disagree. Even after the 20 plus runs I've had of this game, I'm still finding new tricks and routes that I didn't even know existed. Like an NPC that offers to sell you ammo for a discount if you tell them that you love killing terrorists, even if that's not how you feel. A secret compartment in your headquarters that refills with new goodies every time you revisit. Being able to buy bombs from a homeless man in exchange for some drugs. And remember, winners don't use drugs, they just redistribute them. And this game design also extends to the augmentations of the game, abilities that take advantage of your bioelectrical energy, essentially your mana pool. But each augmentation you collect is actually a choice of two, but you can only choose between one or the other, and you're committed to the one that you choose for the rest of the game. Abilities like heavy lifting, faster sprinting, silent footsteps, bullet resistance, all perks that are nice to have but force you to make the most of your current build, and I wouldn't exactly call Deus Ex a short game. Assuming that I'm just playing casually, a run for me today can still take up to 9 hours, with first time playthroughs taking up to 
20 hours. And before we dive deeper, I want to mention that I'm using the Deus EXE launcher for the game, and I recommend that you do the same. It's not much, it just allows your game to be played at the resolution of your choice, as well as other convenient options that aren't available in the base game, like an FOV slider. It also functions a bit as a mod loader, but I'll touch on that after the plot synopsis. Oh yeah, and the name Deus Ex? That's a play on the literary term Deus Ex Machina. It's a term for when a story needs some kind of divine intervention because the writer wrote themselves into a corner and has no idea how else to get the character out of the scenario without supernatural means. But the literal translation translates to God of the Machine? Remember that, that's gonna be important later. But alright, it's gonna be difficult to explain any more of the game without spoiling the rest of it. I know that this is a 20 year old game, but honestly, if you haven't experienced this game, go and buy it on Steam. It goes for sale for like less than one. My plot synopsis is going to be focused more on the route that I personally took for this game, and I doubt that yours will be the same. But without further ado, let's begin. Okay, well technically we're going to take a look at the optional tutorial room before we get started, but this tutorial does have a bit of story shoved into it. A bit at the surface level, as well as some smaller details that won't really make sense unless you've played the game. But it's still there. Despite being a tutorial, I never felt like the game was holding my hand. I already felt immersed in the role of JC Denton being prepared by these believable characters through stealth, hacking, and combat. Every character has their own distinct personality, and even the optional briefings and descriptions near the end offer a sliver of the world that you're about to be thrown into. It's a shame that some people skip this, because it shows JC getting his first mission briefing from Bob Page, a character we'll be seeing more later on. From a mechanical standpoint, the tutorial gives you a decent introduction to key mechanics. Firearms training, explosives that can be thrown or placed, lockpicking and multi-tools that can open doors and keypads respectively, a bit of platforming, and even a quote, simulated encounter with a patrol bot that you can either sneak around, destroy with nearby explosives, or get your limbs blown off by, which you will need to get used to because each key six body parts can be damaged and have their each respective health bars. The less HP you have in your arms, the worse your aim. The less HP in your legs, the slower you run. And if both legs run out of health, you're forced to crouch walk until you can replenish at least one of them, either with a med kit in your grid-based inventory or through a medical bot. There's even a secret hologram near the end congratulating you for your key and eye. Manderley likes to hear which agents find this area. They're usually the ones who take terrorists by surprise in the field. Your brother Paul, for instance. All right, carry on. And Don't once JC receives his mission briefing, it's back to the title screen where the option to start your game awaits you. This review is going to be focused on the normal difficulty, and... Okay, stick with me through this. We open on a conversation between two key characters that we haven't officially met yet, Bob Page and Walton Simons, discussing under a not obviously menacing statue of a massive hand resting over a globe like they're the goddamn Illuminati. A lot of this conversation won't make a lot of sense to a first time player, and it's not supposed to, but it sets up the story and conflicts the game is about to throw at us pretty well once the pieces come together. We've already seen Bob Page from the tutorial, and it's obvious that he's not a good guy from this opening cutscene. Just let the bodies pile up in the streets. A plague has recently sweeped the globe named the Great Death, and these two seem to have a vaccine ready but are selectively distributing it to figures of power to strong arm them to further their own agendas. Has he been infected? Oh yes, most certainly. When I mentioned that we could put him on the priority list for the Ambrosia vaccine, he was so willing it was almost pathetic while also dropping incredibly vague terms like the primary and secondary units, the Aquinas Protocol, all stuff that you won't quite get yet. But to make it short, these guys are assholes who are letting lower income people die from a plague reaping chaos but selling it to powerful people to keep them in their pocket. And just like that, the conspiracy begins. Keep in mind that JC doesn't know any of this. In fact, he's preparing for his first day on the job at UNATCO, the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition, where he's given the intimidating task of eliminating a terrorist leader that's held up at the top of the Statue of Liberty, and given the choice of rescuing a fellow UNATCO agent, Gunther Herman, the guy who trained you in the firearms portion of the tutorial, who is also a mechanically augmented German obsessed with orange soda, no, I wanted orange. who's being held in the statue's lower levels. The terrorist organization known as the NSF, or National Secessionist Force, have hijacked a shipment of the Ambrosia vaccine for the Great Death with the intention of giving it back to the people, though we're not told any of this until we confront their leader at the top of the statue, but only if you choose the correct dialogue prompt. If you threaten to put him in a body bag, he's less likely to have a dialogue with you. Who'd have thunk? We begin the mission on the docks, meeting with JC's brother, Paul. Greeting JC on his first day at UNATCO and giving us the choice between a crossbow loaded with tranquilizer darts, a sniper rifle, or a GEP gun, a reloadable rocket launcher that takes up a ton of space in your inventory 
inventory, but is the rarest of the three offered weapons. So even though I use the Trank crossbow more often, I choose the Gep gun here because you can find a sniper rifle and a crossbow later in the map. That's not to mention that despite what weapon you choose, you do begin the game with a pistol and a cattle prod for short range non-lethal takedowns. <laughs> Paul is a bit of a pacifist, and despite Liberty Island being occupied with terrorists, he insists that you show a bit of mercy, resorting to non-lethal takedowns if you have the means to do so. And we'll show you more respect and reward you with goodies if you run a more pacifist playstyle. This heavily contrasts Gunther Herman, who if rescued, immediately asks you for your pistol so he can gun down every NSF foot soldier he sees. If you just run to the leader at the end of this mission, this will only take you a few minutes. But here's the thing, you can spend up to an hour on this mission gaining extra knowledge and solving second secondary objectives to your heart's content. While you could just barge through the front doors and open fire, you could also meet with double agent Harley Philbin at the opposite side of the island, who gives you a map and also informs JC to not kill the NSF commander, cause insider knowledge is basically useless if the source is dead, and that the leader will surrender at the first sign of force. But to go even further, this other double agent posing as a homeless woman says to ignore everything that Harley says and just sneak in the backside of the statue since there's less soldiers over there. However, if we go in the backside, we could miss our chance to save Gunther, but I did find these tablets giving out the login information for the front gate security system, and because of the build that I've set up before the start of the game, I could hack in and turn the turrets in the building against the NSF, and for any stragglers, I could just make a loud noise and lure them out to an automated death. Though I did almost die trying to save Gunther, whose cell I blasted open with a lamb, essentially a grenade. Gave him my pistol and watched as German John Wick ran for his life. After that, I proceeded up the statue where our companion, Alex Jacobson, tells us that the leader is just up ahead, who surrenders immediately just as Harley told us. Don't shoot. I surrender. You're given the choice to threaten to kill him, or to let him spill the beans and he'll be taken as a prisoner instead of a corpse. I chose the latter, where he doesn't answer exactly why they stole the vaccine other than giving it back to the people, but if you keep talking to him, he brings up valid though seemingly random points. Like how in 1945, corporations had to pay 50% in taxes, but in the distant year of 2052, only pays 5%, a statistic that's startlingly close to home. He brings up how the government uses taxes to slowly but surely take power away from the people, even going further to cite a secret underground government conspiracy involving 19 of the previous US presidents. Remember, this is still the first mission of the game. Don't believe me? It's all in the numbers. For a hundred years, there's been a conspiracy of plutocrats against ordinary people. You have a single fact to back that up? Number one, in 1945, corporations paid 50% of federal taxes. Now they pay about 5%. Number two, in 1900, 90% of Americans were self-employed. Now it's about 2%. So? It's called consolidation. Strengthen governments and corporations, weaken individuals. With taxes, this can be done imperceptibly over time. With the leader taken into custody, JC is sent to UNATCO headquarters, a building conveniently close to the Statue of Liberty. Here we meet our boss, Joseph Manderley, as well as given the option to meet our fellow agents in person, like Anna Navarra, another mechanical augmented agent who prefers to get her hands dirty, Alex Jacobson, our guy in the chair, Jaime Reyes, medical expert, Sam Carter, a former US general who encourages you to take a more pacifistic route out of fear that UNATCO is starting to lean more authoritarian, rewarding you for better gear and upgrades the less people you kill. All right. Like leading a mouse to cheese. And the returning Gunther Herman, who doesn't take too kindly to nanowogs like JC, but has developed a soft spot for him for helping him in the statue, even putting in a good word for you to Anna. It's important to know that JC and his brother Paul Denton are a new breed of nano augmented agents, the first to be put in the field anyways, and that first mission was a test to see if JC was up to the responsibilities about to be placed on him, where the mechanical logs like Anna and Gunther resent the nanowogs, whether it's out of jealousy or spite, we're not told yet. I do not expect you to perform as well as Agent Herman, but the mission will require us to do more than frighten the NSF with our baggy coats that make us look bigger than we really are. 
We're also given the option to equip our first augmentation canister, assuming that you grabbed it at the end of the Liberty Island mission, equipable from the medical bot in Reyes's office. I chose heavy lifting because I like having a bit more control over my environment, but this is just a small part of it. If you take the time to explore every nook and cranny of Unaco headquarters, you can come out with a decent amount of items. Med kits, ammunition, a few locks and multi-tools. It's incredibly rewarding to take the time to explore your surroundings. Once JC is familiar with his new family, he and Anna Navarra are sent by Manderley to New York's Castle Clinton to investigate why the NSF have been sending shipments in and out of Castle Clinton and to retrieve another stolen cache of the Ambrosia vaccine. So Anna is a bit extreme. In a simple investigate and rescue mission, she'd rather me go in guns blazing and mercilessly gun down everyone I'd see, not even caring about securing the vaccine. That's not the kind of agent I strive to be. I'd rather use my surroundings to my advantage and catch them with their pants down. And luckily, there's a way to do just that. A nearby homeless child has seen where the NSF have been operating and is willing to spill the beans in exchange for some food. I'm starving. Do you have anything to eat? All I have is a candy bar. Don't matter. I just need something in my stomach so I can fall asleep. There you go. Do you have a place to stay? I sleep out on the dock where they unload the speedboats. Speedboats? Is that how the NSF get their supplies? I don't know. They're always coming in and out of the tunnel behind the soda machine. Interesting. I spy on them from the crates. The code is 9183. And that's how you skip a firefight. You won't need to travel far to find the Ambrosia Cache stored off to the side here, but you can explore the rest of the facility if you so desire. Otherwise, it's back to Anna, who tries to hold you to Unatco's standards and is willing to give you some extra EMP mines if you give off the impression that you enjoy killing terrorists. And those EMPs are gonna come in handy because the NSF has taken hostages in the subway under Battery Park, rigging the place with tripwires and explosives, which can be temporarily disabled with a well-placed EMP grenade, giving you just enough time to clear out the subway of NSF foot soldiers and save the hostages. Just remember to stay calm and take the time to steady your aim, because one stray bullet is enough to set off the explosives. You can fuck this up, and if you do, you'll face the consequences back at headquarters. JC meets up with Paul at the other end of the subway after the hostages have been rescued or turned into a red jelly, depending on how you played, with him saying that the mission is now solely up to us because of reasons. The NSF have set up a generator acting as an EMP in the middle of Hell's Kitchen, and we're sent in to deal with it. And if you haven't noticed by now, Paul has been acting kinda strange. On top of begging you to go easy on the NSF and cowering out of the generator mission, as well as finding out that he's been issuing UNATCO agents tear gas instead of firearms, which you can take for yourself if you want, it's reasonable to suspect that something might be going on on behind those augmented blue eyes of his. Though your primary objective is to take down the generator, if you know where to look, you can find word that the NSF has taken hostages in a nearby hotel. And the owner who's been taken hostage in his own hotel is oddly reluctant to close up shop. I know I heard something. That's him. He's a cop. I'm hit! Thanks. Assuming you didn't fuck up the hostage situation in the subway, Paul will even give you the key to his hotel room filled with a healthy amount of goodies, complete with a secret keypad behind a painting, opening up the coolest PC setup you've seen in the 2000s, but also contains emails from a couple of characters that'll be important to us later, a man named Juan and another named Tracer. And I swear to god, if a single one of you makes an Overwatch joke out of that, I'm going to lose my fu- The mystery with Paul goes even a bit further. If you take the time to explore a nearby bar, you'll find a pilot who offers to spill some top secret info in exchange for a beer. Telling you about an underground weapon stash that I immediately forgot about afterwards, because if you buy him another beer, he goes as far to discuss Area 51, claiming to have worked as a pilot there, and saying that it has nothing to do with aliens, but believes that it's housing an experimental AI to keep surveillance on American citizens, acting as a central hub for monitoring information on the internet. Oh, and that he also works for UNATCO and flies your brother everywhere. Listen to your brother, JC. Respect his experience. Let's leave it at that. Without much else to do, I broke into the NSF warehouse using a key I looted off of an NSF soldier, broke into the basement first so I can loot this augmentation canister, hacked a computer and shut down the coolant in the generator. 
and with the mission complete, a pilot is sent to retrieve JC, who just happens to be the same Area 51 pilot that we talked to in the bar, telling us that Paul fucked up on his mission and that we need to go to UNATCO ASAP. Also, Gunther's here to meet you on the roof. If you shoot him a couple times to aggro him with good timing and leave, that little clusterfuck you saw in the intro will happen. The reason that JC flies around like this is because JC is actually the camera. Instead of having a third person camera fly around for these cutscenes, it just has JC fly around instead. But if you trigger a conversation, you see JC fly around in real time, and it's just hilarious. Oh my god, Paul really fucked up. The coalition has gone into full disarray, bad enough for the fucking men in black to show up to ask some questions. And though it's a result of the circumstances, we get to finally meet Walton Simons, a character we know to be an asshole from the opening cinematic. Though, again, JC doesn't exactly know that yet. Walton refuses to tell us his name, saying that we're not ready for an introduction yet. More on him in a bit. JC is dispatched back to Battery Park to locate and investigate where the NSF are moving shipments of Ambrosia and other stolen goods. Again. Though not before checking the basement to see what everyone else is up to. Reyes gives us some medkits, Alex is missing, and Carter, Carter isn't a fan of us going full bloodlust back in Castle Clinton. He was going to give us some extra ammunition, but walks back the deal after hearing that we massacred the place. And you know what? I can understand that. I did go a bit gung-ho near the end of that mission. In my day, international peacekeepers were citizens first and soldiers second. You can forget about that extra ammo. I'm only going to give you the multi-tools. I think you should concentrate more on mission objectives and less on the enemy body count. Though I think this might have affected Anna for the worst, cause if you leave Manderly's office you can overhear her saying that she wants JC to handle an assassination. I wasn't told anything about an assassination, and it's at this point where you, the player, start to become a bit weary of the Coalition's agenda. Combined with Paul's disappearance and the antagonist from the intro showing up all buddy buddy with the Coalition, you can put together that something's not right. This feeling can be amplified too if you take the time to follow Simons down to the lower level holding cells that JC doesn't have access to, but can slip into as long as you're trailing Simons. And this whole interaction is a massive shit show. I have one question. They already asked. I don't know. One must admire a man who can keep a secret because he has value. What you know more than others makes money and gives you a measure of power. You Walton Simons, you think I could be bribed? Margaret Forsyth under NSF protection in Queens. Your son Richard attending Bronx Science. You see, I have a few relevant facts myself. Care to make a trade? You wouldn't dare. I'll give you two seconds to decide. Get out of here, Denton. This is none of your business. Time's up. Where is the NSF taking the Ambrosia? They asked me already. I don't know. Need I remind you that in the case of a national emergency, FEMA has a list of six million Americans who will be transported to detention centers? Your tabloids call it RX-84. Yeah, including the President, Congress, and the Supreme Court. In my position, I find it very easy to add names to that list. Go to hell. I can sum it all up in one word. Self-reliance. That's what we stand for. How about you tell me where that shipment is being taken? UNATCO assumes that people are incapable of protecting themselves, and therefore should submit to surveillance and intimidation by an outside force. We won't do it. Certain intellectual properties, aside from the quantities of vaccine, concern me deeply. Has the NSF made any attempt at reverse engineering? Leave me alone. The governments of the world believe an average citizen should not face the threat of terrorism alone. We don't need your help. The technology exists today for an individual to protect his property against explosives, firearms, surveillance, intrusion, contamination. Get the hell out of here, Denton. 350 million fortresses is not my idea of the land of the free. It's better than one big fortress constructed by a corrupt government against its people. If you wanted to save people, you could have unloaded the whole shipment in Manhattan. Why the airlift? You said it yourself. Secrets are power. It's simple numbers. Big companies pay like 2% tax. Well, you and me, we pay like 50. It's the tax code that makes sure big bureaucracy gets bigger and people have no power. You have an assignment in New York, Agent. I expect you to follow orders. Let's get back to the subject of the missing vaccine. All taxes are social engineering. That's always been their real purpose. 
I'm not going to stand here and listen to you badmouth the greatest democracy the world has ever known. What happens is that politicians get money from big companies, so all the social engineering is for making big companies. Like I said, it's simple numbers. We have less civilized ways of making you talk. They already grilled me. But not that patient. You saw nothing, didn't report to Manderley. Wow, that is some accidental symbolism if I've ever seen it. With the NSF cleared out of the subways from the last mission, homeless New Yorkers have set up their residence and sheds outside of the subway entrance. But as you might have expected, these aren't your run-of-the-mill homeless, but rather an underground society of former homeless citizens calling themselves the Mole People who have claimed the abandoned underground New York subways for themselves, complete with a secret entrance disguised as a phone booth. Seriously, a phone booth in 2052? How is no one suspicious of this? You'll end up discovering this yourself thanks Thanks to our old friend Harley, out in the basement begging for some cash. Remember kids, if a homeless dude asks you for money, he might have some important information about a secret underground society. He gives us the passphrase Underworld, which when exchanged with this man gives us the passcode of 6653, which also spells out M-O-L-E. God damn it, I feel stupid not for guessing that. The subways are a strangely complex hub, alive with warring factions and a surprising amount of personality. And after asking around the local residents, you'll find a guy who knows plenty about the NSF's involvement with the mole people, but will only spill it in exchange for some hard labor. And by hard labor, I mean clearing out a blockage so we can return running water to the mole people. However, I needed something explosive if I wanted to get through this rubble, and though I do have the means to do so, I wanted to see how you'd go about this if you were unfortunate enough to not have any explosives going into this mission. And before I knew it, I got mixed up with a gang who offered to sell me a lamb for some steep prices that I wasn't willing to match. However, he offered us an alternative. Take out a drug dealer who's selling on their turf and he'd be willing to part with the lamb. Hey listen, I know they wanted me to kill you, but I'm not exactly the gun for hire type, so I apologize for anything they might do to you. The gang leader wasn't a big fan of my pacifist approach, but why should I care? I got a free lamb out of it. But when I knocked out that drug dealer, I looted two vials of Zyme from his unconscious body, your run-of-the-mill underground drugs, and I was able to trade one vial in exchange for some information that the NSF have been running equipment in and out of the women's restroom that involves a secret keypad under the faucet, which is cool and all, but I also traded the second vial to a guy threatening to blow the place sky high in return for the lamb that he was planning to use. And after that, I finally have some spare lambs to clear out the rubble to turn the water back on. And in exchange, I was finally able to score the passcode that the NSF have been using for that keypad in the women's restroom, revealing a secret door to the NSF's tunnels. I wish I knew this during my first playthrough of the game. I accidentally missed this side quest and ended up blasting open the secret door with the lamb I took. Yeah, you could do that. The goal here is to find a way to open the bathroom at the far side of the tunnels, one of the few doors that can't be lockpicked or hacked open. These are often used to make sure that you don't miss key story dumps or conversations you need to hear to progress. And wouldn't you know it, there's a secret office at the opposite side of the tunnels that can be opened by pressing on this brick. Just be sure to not shoot the first guy you see. This man right here doesn't want to fight you, he's just an accountant, despite the body armor. And offers to order the troops to stand down and a key to the men's bathroom in exchange for not engaging with the soldiers in the tunnels. And lo and behold, the tunnels lead to a private airfield for the NSF's leader, a Juan Lebedev. I was able to stealth my way around most of this section. I accessed the security room from a key I looted off of a guard, and though I could have reprogrammed the turret to take out everyone in the room, I decided to turn it off altogether and deal with everyone silently. And then once everyone's been dealt with, it's time to go loud for the bots. Have you ever heard how loud the Gep Gun's lock-on sound is? He's working with terrorists. Ow. It doesn't take much to break into Lebedev's hangar. Swipe a key off one of these guys, open the gates, break into the barracks, crack the code, and boom. Say hi to Paul. You can relax, JC. I told the troops to stand down. That's right. I'm working for the NSF. So... Yeah, if you've put it together by now, it should be no surprise that Paul has been working as an NSF double agent this whole time, but is quick to recruit us, claiming that he has proof that the Great Death is a man-made virus, and the same company responsible for creating the virus is also manufacturing the vaccine. Also, they could use it to influence governments and even entire countries, something that we the player have gotten a hint of thanks to the intro, but Paul's involvement was the wild card. And after his attempt to recruit us, he begs us to talk to Lebedev, who's a fucking idiot because he left the key to his 
his own hiding space at the top floor of his plane. Lebedev of course surrenders, and cites that UNATCO policy forbids killing unarmed prisoners, and JC, being the good boy to his country that he is, obeys that. Until Anna shows up, demanding us to follow through with the assassination. It was always UNATCO's plan to kill this man, despite the Coalition's policy. And by now, it's up to the player. If Paul defected, it probably wasn't for nothing. But if you let Lebedev say too much, Anna will be quick to spoil the party. And we get around that exactly the way you might expect. And that's it. Anna is gone for the rest of the game, despite having key recurring roles in the story if you don't pull the trigger on her. Up to this point in the video, it might have sounded like I was approaching this game in a way that's similar to a guide rather than a review, but I assure you that's because many of the actions and choices you make in this game can dictate where it goes next, with one key exception that we'll be talking about in a minute. Lebedev knows a great deal about Paul and JC, even going as far to tell us that JC's parents were agents and even implying that JC was a test tube baby cloned from Paul, created to be a tool for the Coalition, which he claims to be a front for an even larger organization, the Majestic 12, which is allegedly a real thing. Majestic 12 was a real part of a leaked government document involving high-ranking conspiracy cover-ups, mostly cited in conspiracy theories about aliens and UFOs. There's nothing out there to prove that it's real, but that's exactly what they want you to think. Jacobson is quick to wipe the infolink data of you killing Anna, but the dude is reasonably suspicious of what the hell we were even thinking. No no one knows that we're the one who killed Anna, and even tugged at my heart a little bit when running into a distraught Gunther, devastated over Paul's defection and Anna's death. And Jacobson, oh man. They'll have you killed. They won't even blink an eye. Neither did I. Jesus Christ, JC, you just killed someone. Manderly is of course pissed off, yet everyone else seems to be happy that we're not going to fall under the shadow of our brother, but oh, just you wait. Paul and the NSF had intentions of trying to synthesize more of the Ambrosia vaccine, which Manderly clearly knows about but doesn't even bother to tell us. Instead mentions that they flipped the kill switch on Paul's augmentations, forcing his augs to slowly kill him in the case that he ever went rogue, and even threatens that JC has the same kill switch inside of him. It's like being forced to commit war crimes with a gun held to your head. Walton Simons, who's still been chilling out in UNATCO, finally reveals that he's the head of FEMA, which doesn't make a lot of sense because of the opening when he was talking with Bob Page about making an appointment with FEMA. Why would he need an appointment with the very agency that he's the head of? What the fuck is going on? I swear I just saw a Roomba open a door, and I'm starting to panic. Naturally, Manderly wants us to prove our loyalty to the Coalition, with the intention of sending us to Hong Kong to meet with Paul's NSF allies to shut down whatever operation they might be running. But Jock has a different plan in mind, returning us to Hell's Kitchen for a second time to meet up with Paul, who started to succumb to his kill switch. JC tries to get Paul to come with him back to Hong Kong, but Paul first needs us to send out an NSF distress signal, which JC is willing to do if Paul can provide proof that UNATCO is behind the Grey Death. Though before taking up that task, I took a detour to stock up on equipment in that underground cache Jock told me about last time I was here, but heard word on the street that some punk named Jojo is terrorizing the local Tan Hotel, the same one held up with NSF soldiers from our last visit. Yeah! Wait, wait, I need to do something real quick. Oh my god, daddy. What a shame. <laughs> Paul sends us to a former NSF warehouse, now under UNATCO's authority, with the signal needing to be sent from a computer at the top floor, with optional proof of UNATCO's ties to the Great Death found heavily fortified in the basement, which, yeah, UNATCO has not only been controlling the spread of the virus, but assassinating individuals who knew about it, making their death look like an accident. And once at the top floor, JC aligns the building's satellites, hacks into the control panel, and sends out the distress signal, where immediately, Walton Simons, the head of FEMA, which may I remind you has been for natural disaster aid, sends UNATCO troops to kill you. Even contacting JC through his info link to tell him how much of a mistake he was to the coalition. And just like that, all of these soldiers you fought side by side with are now trying to kill you with no remorse. We'll find him. And this isn't an isolated incident. Law enforcement all across New York is now looking for your augmented ass, all the way up to Paul's hotel room, who tells you to flee into the subways to continue his mission, but I don't want to leave my brother behind. Authorities have prepared to storm Paul's apartment, and it's up to you to either run or stand by your brother. Oh shit, never mind, I think he's got it. I call this one the Gordon Freeman! <laughs> 
But before we talk about what happens next, I want to bring up a little story of what happened the first time I played this game. The way this scene works is no matter what, you'll join Paul in his battle against the Majestic 12. If you stay in the hotel and fight side by side with him, Paul survives for the rest of the game. However, if you escape out of the window like Paul says, Paul ends up dying in battle and is absent for the remainder of the game. But there's remnants of a cut third option to stay with Unatco that seems to have been cut relatively late into the game, because dialogue for this can still be activated in the vanilla game. If you interact with the soldiers at the NSF warehouse and return to Paul without sending the signal, you'll get this dialogue. I checked it out. Sorry, Paul. Unatco isn't perfect, but I'm not a terrorist. And I guess we go our separate ways. Too bad it had to be this way. Yeah, the offer still stands. If you want to go to Hong Kong. No, no, I'll be fine on my own. JC, if only you'd open your eyes for one second. I wish I knew how to convince you. You're not supposed to get this. This doesn't go anywhere, and this stumped me for the longest time, and seemed to have broken something in the game. I ended up googling the passcode for the subway because I gave up in what I thought the game was telling me to do, and all I found on the other side was Gunther with his AI broken, just sitting there, letting me pelt him with whatever I had until I eventually ran out of ammo. Creepy stuff. So anyways, regardless of what path you take, JC ends up being held in a Majestic 12 holding cell, deep underground with his gear confiscated. If you killed Anna, then you'll have no no choice but to sit in silence for a bit, until just when all hope seems lost, a heavily encrypted signal comes through your info link, calling himself Daedalus, named after the Greek legend of Icarus, remotely cutting power to the jail cell just long enough for JC to break out of his holding cell, and offers JC the code to escape, but not before meeting with Paul, who's held up in the prison's infirmary. I really love this section. Though short-lived, I really love having to grab any gear you can get your hands on just to stay alive. It made me use weapons that otherwise I had no interest in, like the assault rifle and combat shotgun. However, likely an oversight in how the game handles your inventory, you still have all of your ammo, so if you pick up a gun that you previously had, like the 10mm pistol, you still have plenty of rounds at your disposal. The underground Majestic 12 facility is where the game shifts into its second act. Your only objective here is to find Paul, who in this scenario, survived the scuffle at the Ton Hotel, but is still dying from the kill switch. Kind of. A sort of defector scientist says that the Dentons are somehow immune to the Grey Death and that they were tasked with figuring out why, while another tablet even says that he tested positively for the Grey Death but is showing no symptoms of it. So that's neat. However, that doesn't mean that the kill switch isn't still killing him from the inside out. You're also given the secondary task of protecting and escorting out this NSF foot soldier, but I prefer to clear the place out myself and tell him to make a run for it once I know that he'll actually survive. Spoiler alert, I actually completely forgot about him, so sorry about that Miguel. Which is probably for the best because of these fucking things roaming the hall. You could even find tablets saying that these bots are being rolled out to troubled areas like Hong Kong, Paris, and Philadelphia. This is starting to get a bit scary. With Paul found to be safe and sound, Daedalus gives us the passcode to escape the place, and lo and behold, we've been in Unatco this whole time, confirming to us the player that, yeah, Unatco is definitely a front for Majestic 12. Thankfully, our old friends are more than happy to see us, with some of them even willing to join our cause after finding that Unatco has been lying to them. Jaime Reyes is more than happy to join JC, even giving him his last augmentation canister meant to be JC's welcome aboard present. Guess it will have to be a retirement gift. That gift being a regeneration augmentation, which is fucking broken, I'll talk more about that later. Though of all of them, Alex Jacobson is the only one you're required to talk to, as he's needed to give you the key to the front door. He's willing to join us, though JC is quick to assume that he's Daedalus, which does nothing but freak Alex out because he's the guy who created Unatco's security, and finding out that something got through it probably won't help him sleep at night. Sergeant Carter makes the decision to stay with Unatco, but doesn't get in our way, even unlocking the armory for us to load up, and even makes a good point against us recruiting people. The only way to save the agency is for the good people to stay. That's how I see it. This did make me reconsider if what I was doing is right. They can also find an encrypted email on his computer thanking him for helping JC escape, so I don't know. I was going to give my resignation to Manderly, but look who he's on the phone with, Mr. FEMA himself. This conversation doesn't really go too well, he damns us for leaving the coalition out to dry. But if you don't talk to him and instead assassinate the guy just before giving him a chance to talk, this happens. Splendid. You did our dirty work for us. Figured he was your type. A real hard ass. On the contrary, he was somewhat too careful and urbane for that position. I'm going to have to step in myself and restore discipline. Well, since that makes you my new boss, take a long look at Manderly's dead body. Consider that my resignation. I don't have time to write a letter. 
You can't run, Denton. Even if you escape, your kill switch is counting down. You'll be dead in 23 hours. Another 50 billion dollars down the drain. We'll see about that. Wow, that is kind of fucked. This Daedalus character turns out to be in touch with more folks than we thought, even telling Jock to pick JC up from Unatco, telling us that we need to meet with a Tracer Tong to defeat the kill switch. The same Tong that we saw in Paul's computer back at the Ton Hotel. Wouldn't you know it, the Majestic 12 have a pretty big grasp globally, locking Jock's copter on the way to Hong Kong, and JC's gotta find a way to get out because of course he does. Usually when I get to this part, I just run downstairs guns blazing, but after a bit of exploration, I found a keypad that once activated, releases sleeping gas into the lower floors, taking out most of the MJ-12 troopers in the basement. Yeah, it almost killed me, but it was kinda cool. Oh, I don't think that was sleeping gas. You find the key to the control bay in this locker here, but instead of lockpicking it, I just blow it up with a lamb, and boom, Jock is set free blasting a wall for us to escape and then flees. But oh no, the security bots are out! Cool! I oh, do you hear that? That's composer Alexander Brandon absolutely killing it on the synths. Deus Ex's soundtrack is one of my favorite out there, not only because it's a great soundtrack, but each area is divided into four separate tracks. One for conversations, ambience, combat, and death. And with over 30 areas, that means the game has nearly over 115 original compositions made for the game. Not all of them were composed by Mr. Brandon, with Unreal Tournament's Dan Gardepi and, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Mikhail Van den Boss? I'm sorry. But these guys composed 6 of the 30 sets of tracks for the game. Though likely a result of the small team size, Mr. Brandon also voices some of the Unatco troops that are now hunting us down. The trooper that tried to sell us munitions at the beginning of the game? That was him. Tracer Tong's compound doesn't really make an effort to stay hidden. It certainly doesn't help when you have a unique NPC acting as your bouncer, who despite knowing Paul wants JC to prove that he's not here to cause Tong any harm, sending JC to investigate a lady named Maggie Chow, a woman who's manipulated a civil war between two of Hong Kong's triads, the Red Arrow and the Luminous Path, the former Tracer Tong was once a part of. The triads were once at peace with each other, until an ultra-powerful nanotech sword dubbed the Dragon's Tooth was stolen by Miss Chow, blaming it on the Luminous Path, where ever since the triads have... Uh, War is hell. Miss Chow's apartments resides on the other side of the Canal Road, part of the Hong Kong hub that's one of the more interesting hubs in the game to me. I'm not sure what it is, the relaxed ambient piece that's playing probably helps, but it's just so calm and quiet. It's easy to get immersed in exploring the place, though it's also incredibly easy to get lost as well. Heard the name Tracer Tong? Tong, yes. Friend of a luminous path triad. And by extension, enemy of the Ray Air. <laughs> Mr. J.C. Denton, in the fresh, as dark and serious as his brother. Wow, that is- okay, no, that's just blatantly racist. Miss Chow, when confronted, pleads innocence, but not before throwing us a curveball, claiming that she knows the Denton brothers directly and that she was the one responsible for converting Paul's allegiance to the NSF, but even going a step further to claim that she's Paul's secret wife? Something that with a bit of exploration can be proven to be complete bullshit. There was a point that I found that I must have stumbled upon something great because her maid was on my ass, telling me that I needed to leave. Don't make me Call the police. It's the laser sword. Of course it's the laser sword. It shouldn't be a surprise that she had the dragon tooth all along. What is surprising is who she's been in contact with this whole time. Yep, it's Mr. FEMA man again. Once JC has possession of the dragon tooth, he's contacted directly by the paranoid Mr. Tong, who begs JC to use the dragon tooth sword as proof of Miss Chow's manipulation, bringing the triads together again. Make no mistake though, this dragon tooth nanite sword is yours to keep for the rest of the game, if you want. Despite it making no physical sense in your inventory. The thing is just a hilt, but it remains unsheathed in your grid inventory. I understand that this is for balancing reasons, but now I'm just imagining a Jedi who never retracts his lightsaber when storing it in his belt. Thankfully, you won't have to wait too long to get a chance to try out your new nanite sword, where once peace has been made between the triads, MJ-12 mechs storm the nightclub where the meeting takes place, and yeah, the dragon tooth is a one-hit kill. Oh. Oh. Ah. Clear, Mr. Tank. Clear them all. 
but these guys also have a high chance of dropping bioelectric cells, which can replenish your augmentation energy, allowing you to constantly string together whatever augs you need to activate for your survival. And if you have the regeneration augmentation, you're almost invincible. With the triads reunited, Tong finally grants you access to his underground lab, which is hidden behind not one, but two secret doors. This man is paranoid, that's apparent from the minute you first meet the guy. But a deal is a deal, and after zapping JC a few times in the head, the kill switch has been defeated. A simple switch, as they call it. Also, Alex is here. Jacobson, not the composer. He took JC's advice to help out and is now aiding Tracer Tong a bit, and even took the time to look into this Daedalus character. Okay, so here we go. It turns out that this thing contacting us isn't some elite anonymous hacker, but rather a rogue AI created for global surveillance. But according to Alex's research, the project was shut down after the government decided it wasn't worth the money. The AI was somehow resurrected and has now decided to help us. But that's all Mr. Jacobson has for now. Tong tells JC that Paul is on his way to the compound, but that the truce between the triads will be short-lived, saying that the Dragon Tooth Sword is a doomsday weapon that will inevitably cause discourse between the factions in the near future, and that the best course of action is to break into the MJ-12 front Versa Life, steal the blueprint for the Dragon Tooth, mass-produce the sword, and distribute it to the triads. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. When has giving every country nukes ever been a bad idea? Wow, that is not subtle at all. The only way to the underground labs is through a back door locked with a key code that can't be hacked. I almost got the code off of this guy until I realized that I didn't have enough cash to bribe him. Thankfully, though in a sad way, this employee was ready to put his life on the line and expose how fucked up the place is if I kill his boss. Oh, it turns out I already had the code. I just killed a man for no reason. <laughs> oh shit, it's the place from the intro. That's how you know that this isn't gonna turn out too well. So I know that the way that I have to go is under this hand, but I decided to explore a bit and found a vent in the bathroom, leading me down a path that I've never been before, taking me conveniently to the terminal that I needed to hack. Even with all of the playthroughs of this game I have under my belt, it's amazing that I'm still finding stuff like this. Unfortunately, my stealth bonus was ruined because the alarm triggered the minute I stepped off this platform. Though fighting my way out of the labs wasn't nearly as difficult, I had a harder time dealing with the security guards on the upper level. Tong organizes a meeting between the triads where the ROM info of the Dragon Tooth form a single united group that I still have no idea why this is important to the plot, but hey, it's rewarding. Again, accept our thanks, Mr. Denton. You will have to join us for drinks at the Lucky Money later tonight. Hey, I don't see why not. Oh. Alright, that's why. With the Dragon Tooth blueprint secured, Tong sends us back to the Versa Life facility, but tells us that an informant of his found a secret way to the level 2 labs that can be accessed through the Canal Road. Something that, once again, I never thought to do. I always fought my way through the lab again. I never even knew that this way existed. Oh hell yeah! More augmentations! Give me that Mountain Dew voltage! Oh hey! Bad move, Agent. Hello, Maggie. You just got yourself killed. Oh, if it's a lightsaber duel you want, it's a lightsaber duel you'll get! So the whole reason that we've been sent back down here is because of a device called a Universal Constructor. It's basically the closest we have to alchemy, but it's actually science, cause that makes sense. This machine is what's producing the nanites that are responsible for the Great Death, and we're sent down here to destroy it. There's only a handful of them in existence because of how complicated they are. <laughs> oh shit, are those spiders? Oh no. Don't know if I care for your sense of humor. Humor? The Illuminati stuff. I was risking my life in there. Okay, well at least JC was just as confused as I was. Yeah, Tong isn't kidding about the Illuminati stuff. This isn't like my papers please review. It turns out that a super freighter the Majestic 12 have been using to transport the virus and the vaccine belonged to a former Illuminati leader, Stanton Dowd, and sends an equally confused jock to send us back to Hell's Kitchen for a third time to meet with the Illuminated One. Turns out Mr. Dowd caught a bit of the Grey Death going around, but thankfully knows the exact super freighter the Majestic Fantastic 12 has been using to transport the virus, deducing that the only location that could store the super freighter on the east coast is in an abandoned New York submarine base, but also asks us out of the kindness of our heart if we could bring back a sample of the Ambrosia vaccine just to give him a hand. <laughs> hey, what's going on in here? Nope, fuck, nope, nope, get back in your box. Coincidentally, I ran into a soldier at the bar who used to work in that submarine facility before FEMA kicked everyone out, and offered to reach out to a few of his buds still there that I was coming. So I was able to get a bit of help from the inside. Hey, you're the guy Vinny was talking about, Sandra's friend. 
The plan is to destroy the freighter from the inside, destroying five key welding points with explosives so that once the bilge pipes are set in reverse, the ship tears itself apart from the inside out. Let me just snag a vial of the vaccine before I go, blow the last weak point, reverse the flow, and oh shit. Wait, 30 minutes? Shit, why am I running? All right, now to go meet with Stanton and- Yes? What is it? Oh, you seem suspicious. What is this thing you have in your closet? <laughs> JC reunites with Stanton, who says no one should be working the entrance this late, so yeah, we're kind of fucked. But also that he's figured out who manufactured the virus, sort of. A man named Morgan Everett, though he didn't make it with malicious intent. The virus originally started as a nanite injection to make those with augmentations less susceptible to augment rejection. But it was Bob Page who turned it into a weapon, forcing those even without augmentations to suffer and eventually die from their body rejecting augments that they don't even have. Remember this, this will be important two games later. Okay, so the Majestic 12 show up to the surprise of no one, and I managed to die right as soon as I talked to Jock. So I just accidentally triggered the dead man walking exploit. This is a trick that speedrunners use, because as far as the game's concerned, my health is below zero, and hostile NPCs are programmed to start ignoring you when you drop below zero health for those death cinematics. However, even the slightest amount of damage is enough to kill you for good. But if I play it safe, I'm just invisible to everyone. I planned on showing this off later at the end of the review. It's a complete coincidence that I had it happen while recording my main run. Unfortunately, my dead man walking glitch didn't really have a chance to shine, because I needed to traverse through this room full of radiation. Even a rad suit combined with my radiation resistant augs couldn't save me. With the aid of Tong, JC makes his way to the entrance of the Paris Catacombs, where a handful of silhouette members, a group once part of the Illuminati, are taking refuge from the Majestic 12. Also, did anyone else not know that this was a real place? I thought this was made up for the game. I didn't know the catacombs were real. Now laugh, as the public school system has failed me. Interestingly enough, this group here is the same group that we sent Paul's distress signal to earlier in the game. It's good to see that plot point wasn't abandoned. JC is tasked with rescuing a group of Silhouette prisoners in exchange for the whereabouts of Nicolette Duclair, daughter of the leader of Silhouette who knows where to find Morgan Everett. This area of France is chock full of optional side content. Everything I just told you is all of the essential information you need to know, but I spent so long exploring the lockdown city life. I almost got mixed up in a drug trade until the buyer just disappeared. I turned a giant mech against the Majestic 12 and even overheard parents who are afraid of their child being drafted into the Majestic 12. And if you didn't fuck up the conversation like I did, you can meet Jaime Reyes here, who gives you the means to skip the Gunther Herman boss fight later in the game. Unfortunately, you'll have to see me do it the non-cheesed way. Once again, this game makes a huge effort to make its world feel alive, but that feeling isn't always a happy one. And no comment brings us closer to that feeling than this back and forth. No revolutionaries? You must not mind martial law. The only way to maintain order. Don't you miss using the metro? A small inconvenience. The city must be kept safe for those of us who are working and trying to pull the country out of this depression. What if I told you that the depression was caused by a cabal of wealthy businessmen who want to rule the world? These stories, I hear them every day. Always from someone who wants to blame other people for his bad luck. God, that's a bit too relevant right now. Once you return to the main quest, you'll find that Nicolette Duclair has turned to a life of partying after her mother died, who tried to play coy until she assumed that she could trust us. Onwards to ye mother's house. That's right, keep running, augmented man. Nicolette leads us to her mother's home in the hopes of finding a way to contact Morgan Everett from a computer room locked away behind a secret wall in the basement that she doesn't even know about. But you can explore the rest of your mansion on your own while Nicolette delivers exposition, learning secrets and even computer passwords as you explore. What are you looking for? Jesus Christ, stop! After some digging, JC finds the hidden computer, prepped to send an SOS to Morgan Everett, who contacts us shortly after, agreeing to work with us to stop the virus, in return for us finding some of his old research from an abandoned Knights Templar Cathedral? Okay, I hope you haven't forgotten about Gunther because he's really becoming a pain in the neck. He is pissed at us for killing Agent Navara. And after hours of taunting us, it's finally time for the showdown. I regret that only once we worked together. Now the game has changed. You came all the way to Paris to tell me that? It is a simple message I am demonstrating. We know where you are going and what you intend. That doesn't mean you can stop me. 
I have been upgraded for this assignment. I believe. Oh my god, really? Alright, get back here, you mechanical fuck. I guess Walton Simons has been watching this whole time, because he calls us in a nearby hologram immediately following Gunther's death, taunting us and claiming that the only way we could synthesize enough of a cure for the Great Death is with the only remaining Universal Constructor kept under Majestic 12 surveillance. But even says that he's grateful of us for killing Gunther? Laugh it up, Denton. Next time I won't use an old box of bolts like Gunther. The only reason I let him go to Paris is that I was sick of his moaning about Navarra and constant requests for a tune-up. You sent him because you knew he would fight to the death. He was the last of the mechs. Next time you will face someone of your own abilities. Wow, that is... that is fucked. After getting the info we need off of the Templar's computers, Everett agrees to meet us, sort of. The man is paranoid and doesn't want to compromise the location of his base of operation, sending an associate of his to drug us before transporting us to Everett's house. Do what you must. Step a little closer. See, si, no inconvenience whatsoever. That was easy. And hey, Alex is here too! Though not just to help out with the virus, but to also give us a warning. It turns out Tracer Tong had a meltdown and flew the coop, and doesn't really trust Everett, sending Alex to keep tabs on the former Illuminati leader. Everett's mansion is fucking weird too. Giant aquariums, secret doors, prototype AIs. Oh yeah, Everett's the man who created the Daedalus AI, revealing that it was built for mass surveillance to find terrorists before they even attacked. However, it ironically labeled the US government a terrorist organization and fled. And because of its Ultron-like programming, as long as the internet is around, so will Daedalus. Though unlike Daedalus, that mysteriously threatening Icarus AI that's been contacting us was built by none other than Bob Page using remnants of the Daedalus AI, created to become what Daedalus wasn't, a malevolent AI keeping tabs on the rest of the world for the Majestic 12's agenda, and is being used to track the whereabouts of JC and the Daedalus AI. Everett wants to interface Daedalus with the last known universe constructor in hopes of mass producing enough vaccine for the Great Death, which also turns out to not be your typical vaccine, but rather a way to shut off the nanites of the virus infecting the host? It's kinda cool in a fucked up way. But on my way out, I found this hidden door in the bathroom, leading to what looks like a cryo chamber. This is Lucius De Beers, the real leader of the Illuminati. Well, not anymore. He froze his body after falling ill in hopes that one day he'd be revived once the technology was available. At least according to Everett, who, spoiler alert, has no plans on reviving him despite said technology being a reality. So fuck it, why make this man suffer? What did I tell you? That was my former colleague, my friend. He wasn't doing very well, and he was in pain, but I wanted to keep him alive. Stop messing with my equipment and get to the helicopter. But to make things even stranger, I found a code in the room with Lucius, which led me to the first known prototype of the Echelon project, codenamed Morpheus, a prototype for the Daedalus and Icarus AIs, who are filled to the brim with information about everyone, including JC. Planned to be a mass surveillance system, but was turned into a fun tourist attraction who amuses passers-by by citing information the government has stored on him. And yes, this is where we get hard confirmation that JC Denton is in fact a clone of Paul. How about a report on yourself? I was a prototype for Echelon 4. My instructions are to amuse visitors with information about themselves. I don't see anything amusing about spying on people. Human beings feel pleasure when they are watched. I have recorded their smiles as I tell them who they are. Some people just don't understand the dangers of indiscriminate surveillance. The need to be observed and understood was once satisfied by God. Now, we can implement the same functionality with data mining algorithms. Okay, this game's starting to get in my head. But back in the room with Lucius, I noticed a camera terminal with a dead mechanic hidden behind some barrels. And once confronting the living mechanic, he sounded off. Is something wrong? Huh? No, I said I checked her out. You know there's something wrong when a casual NPC has a unique voice actor. Hey! Why'd you kill Everett's mechanic? Something about that guy didn't smell right. You better double check your systems. What did he work on? The fuel system. Hmm. Now that you mention it. Wait a minute. This isn't right. What isn't? Oh my god, JC, a bomb! A bomb. There it is. There. Relax. 
I disable the detonator. We can drop the thing in the Atlantic on the way back to the States. Make a good detective, JC. do slow down a bit once we're sent to Vandenberg to rig up the Universal Constructor. If it weren't for the troops taking control of the base, we'd just need to slip into the door on the second floor. But wouldn't you know it, the only dude with the key to the labs died in the maintenance tunnels, which have been sealed off until we could take out the bots patrolling the area, which I tried to take out by disabling them right from the control panel, but gave up finding the second switch to do so. So I just blew them up using my surplus of GEP gun rockets. That's the last of them. The base is no longer under lockdown. But finally, JC makes it to the Vandenberg UC, which is, get this, operated by formal slash rebel Area 51 employees now going by X-51. <laughs> yeah, we're bringing Area 51 into this mess. Turns out though, their leader, Gary Savage, sent his daughter to steal parts from Bob Page's Universal Constructor, but ended up apprehended by the Majestic 12, and is now being held hostage. This news isn't broken to us until after JC attempts to interface Daedalus with the UC, leading to a booby trap protocol to activate merging the Daedalus and Icarus AIs together, now identifying as Helios. Bob Page uses this as an opportunity to crack into our info link and announce his ultimatum. Return the stolen Universal Constructor parts or say goodbye to his daughter, and if he sees JC in any way, he won't hesitate to put her down. But given the weight of the situation, JC and Savage agree that the best course of action is to attempt to rescue Tiffany, as her fate would inevitably end the same way if we were to fail. Also, Carter's back. Turns out everyone at UNACO got the boot after Manderly was, uh... <laughs> fired. It's nice to have a familiar face on the team again, though it is a shame we don't see him again beyond this point, at least in my experience. <laughs> Shit, it's Sandra from the Dawn! And that's about as far as that character interaction goes. Tiffany is being held near an abandoned gas station, which used to be home to these homeless folks who were kind enough to give me a key that they smuggled out to let me sneak in through the sewers. Ah, shit. In my run, Tiffany was safe and sound, and after dealing with a single flimsy mech, I was able to take her back to Vandenberg without a problem, while also taking on the mission that Tiffany started, raiding the Ocean Lab for the Universal Constructor schematic. I was able to stealth my way around a good amount of the Ocean Lab, thanks to this lady letting me slip in through the gator tubes. Well, not technically gators. You know what I mean. What are these things, and why are they? Hello, sir, I would like to borrow a submarine. Mind if I borrow one of the subs? Not the one on the right. I am replacing the rotors. Then I'll take the other one. You must have authorization. I need some equipment from the Ocean Lab. Lives depend on it. Ask the appropriate authority for the security login to open the sub bay doors. If you don't know what that means, you don't belong in here and should leave immediately. So the ocean floor labs are completely fucked. Cameras don't really work and turrets shoot on sight. And to make things worse, all of these experimental creatures from mini acid spitting raptors to the before mentioned Karkians are on the loose. Jesus, the bastard bit my legs off! It's not long before JC makes his way to the terminal for the Universal Constructor blueprints, but surprise, Helios and in extension Bob Page intercepted the transmission and effective immediately have begun production on their new Universal Constructor inside of Area 51 to create a new virus, threatening that even if we can mass produce a cure, all it'll take to make a new virus is, and I quote, All I have to do is find a very large prime number and multiply. Yeah, cool, math leads to the end of the world. I knew I shouldn't have flunked Algebra 2. Oh, hey, FEMA man. If you recall our chat in the break room at UNATCO, you know that I have the same augmentation technology as you. Then this will be a good fight? With the exception that I have a newer version of the firmware. Oh, in that case, bye, bitch. Oh, apparently in retaliation to us having the UC blueprint, Bob Page is now nuking Vandenberg. Oh shit, Paige is nuking Vandenberg! Alright, Jock, let's go! Please! So if JC is fast enough, then our goal here is to reroute the nuke away from Vandenberg and over to Area 51, where Bob Page has been operating. Thank god the Majestic 12 are too stupid to update their shit. All of the silo doors are using the same codes from back when Savage worked here. Thanks to that, I was able to slip by pretty easily. Why are you locked in the bathroom? It's also at this point that I put a bit of XP towards my rifle skill, turning my already silent sniper rifle into a borderline silent railgun at times. 
we've only got one more mission to go, and I still have all of this ammo that I've been hoarding through the entire game, so I thought I'd put it to good use. JC flips the override switch on the rockets and hacks into the system, successfully rerouting it to Area 51. <laughs> yep, we're nuking Area 51, where the Helios AI and Bob Page have been waiting. I actually really like this game's take on Area 51. Instead of it being a facility housing aliens and all that cliche shit, it's actually a giant hub where all sorts of information pass through, from emails, phone calls, texts, everything is monitored as part of the Echelon mass surveillance system, just like Jock told us at the beginning of the game. Turns out Jock's the real deal, though your first impressions of the facility are going to be a bit rubble e. Ah, oh, fuck, what do you want, Mr. Superior Firmware? You take another step forward, and here I am again. Like your own reflection repeated in a hall of mirrors. That makes me one ugly son of a bitch. How'd my face get all marked up with bioelectrics? I am the more advanced model, Denton. It's time for you to retire. Anyways, welcome to Area 51. Most of it is underground, so I hope you brought something comfy to wear. The entirety of this mission in the hour plus it takes is one giant tug of war over JC Denton. Everett, Tong, and even the Helios AI all have different plans for you. Welcome to the end game, and thank god it isn't a simple multiple choice question for each of the three endings, with each path requiring a decent amount of time put into them. Though sadly the ending isn't affected by any choices prior made to this moment. That feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. Everett contacts you early on, wanting you to kill Bob Page and use his tech to aid in the restoration of the Illuminati. Tong, however, wants to destroy the entire facility by setting off the reactors, killing all forms of global communication, bringing the world into another Dark Ages. And then there's the Helios AI, which over the course of the game has been slowly becoming more and more curious about humanity, and decides that JC would be a better candidate to merge with to fix the problems in the world than Bob Page, who has already replaced a majority of his body with augmentation prepping to merge with the Helios AI for evil ruling the world purposes. Soon I will be pure light, pure energy. And then Paul shows up to tell us that, hey, the Helios AI has already demonstrated its power over the world, shutting down and effectively replacing the Chinese government and bringing the world economy into a new prosperous age allowing trade again, saying that maybe if the Helios AI merges with someone who knows the difference between right and wrong, that maybe merging wouldn't be such a bad idea. Okay, so I couldn't think of any other way to do this segment, so I'm just gonna go through all three endings in order of my least to most favorite. I don't know, there's only three of them. <laughs> The Dark Ages ending is a strange one. The presentation, the music, it's all good, but it's probably the ending that I agree with the least. Sure, it would restore communicative freedom to the rest of the world, and that's a good thing, but it's literally throwing the world into ruins, and who's to say that another group with an equally malicious agenda wouldn't just rise up from the ashes? Remember, the villains of this game were the ones who created the internet as we know it. Most citizens probably didn't even know that these were terrible people. If it were to be restored, we should be a bit skeptical of who's doing so. Also, Tong's delivery of this line is just terrible. JC, the net's going, the net's going black. This is supposed to be a line where he's stuttering, but he just reads it again. This is the same voice actor for Manderly, Jock, and Lucius De Beers, so I don't know why he fumbles this line so bad. Helios, what's happening? The safety interlocks for the power generator have been disengaged. Engage them! Immediately! I cannot. Our systems are not interfaced with the generator technology. No! Final safety warning. Nominal functional level will be exceeded in 3, 2, 1. <laughs> I have a feeling that this is the ending that had the most time and resources put into it. I gave you life! I- ah! JC and Everett have assumed command of the Majestic 12 facilities and are now using them to restore balance to the world. And who are we? Who are we really? We are the Invisible Hand. We are the Illuminati. We come before and after. We are forever. And eventually, Eventually, we will lead them into the day.
Yeah, just like how you led Lucius de Beers into his cryopod. This ending is alright. It's definitely the most cinematic, and in a way, it's pretty rewarding. The way that the visuals parallel the intro to the game to a poetic degree, not just with the hand on the globe, but also with the cutaways. The music also does a fantastic job at setting the tone, and I love JC's delivery of this line right here. Do you really think they're ready for that? After everything you've seen, everything you've done, no. Not yet. Man, J. Anthony Frank absolutely kills it as JC. I love this ending so much. I used to think it was because I got to merge with a giant robot AI, and yeah, I still love that, I'm a sucker for AIs and robots, but I've come to realize that it's a bit more than that. This ending is rewarding you, specifically the player. Regardless of your beliefs, this ending is putting you in control. You, as JC Denton, know what's best for the world, and merging with an AI that's capable of restoring governments literally overnight, you literally become God of the Machine. I love this game. I don't know, it's hard to put into words. That's why I looked at every nook and cranny I could in this game. I have no idea how else I could have approached reviewing this game and still felt like I was doing it justice. It's larger than life story using elements that, for better or for worse, still remain relevant 20 years later. That makes every repeat playthrough of it hit you just a little bit different. It's no wonder that this game still has a thriving community that gathers around to celebrate this game to this day. And I won't dispute that this is possibly one of the best video games ever made. I don't know, maybe that's a reach. Sure, the controls are clunky and take some time to get used to, but I think that's just the way it was meant to be. This is also one of the reasons I'm hesitant at the idea of a remaster of this game. So much of the clunkiness of this game comes together like puzzle pieces that I feel like a remaster or a remake of this game just wouldn't hold the same weight. Though I'd love to be proven wrong. There are certainly points of this game that could be improved. The hacking is a simple button that you click and wait for, the AI could use a bit of tuning up, and some of these skills, especially swimming, are just downright useless. I suppose I suppose that if a remaster were to trim a lot of the fat, then maybe it could work. Unfortunately, the closest we got to a remaster was this mess. Ow. Deus Ex The Conspiracy, a PS2 exclusive port of the game with enough changes to make it its own sort of beast. Honestly, it's not even so much a port, but rather a reimagining of the original game. This is apparent from before you even make it to the title screen. The intro cutscene of Bob Page and Walton Simons has been completely reworked into a pre-rendered cinematic with a drastic tone shift, mostly due to the shift away from the original music piece that accompanied the cutscene to a newer, ambient one that still feels cheesy, but a little less so than the the original. And hey, check this out, we actually have some proper UI graphics now. I can't say I'm the biggest fan of the menu's presentation, but it's still nice and overall feels streamlined for a controller, which I guess is something that I can say for the rest of this port. It is painfully streamlined. I mean, it makes sense. The amount of bindings that the original game made you keep track of couldn't really translate to a controller well at the time, and the rest of the game had to compensate with a very generous auto-aim, a single unified health bar, dumbed down maps and pathways, and an awkward side effect of the PS2 hardware, a much slower game overall. Though I think that's the biggest hit against it. The slower feel of the game, as well as the smaller map sizes, are a huge pace breaker, but I don't really think there's anything they could have done about it at the time. But oh god, these map sizes! The Liberty Island mission, the mission that only took up a single map in the original PC release, has been divided into four smaller maps, each with 20 second plus loading zones in between. One for the docks, the front of the statue, the backside, and the inside. But aside from that, I think that's where the complaints end. Though a lot of the changes do come down to preference, uh, the first one you're most likely to notice is the reworked theme song. While the original theme is still there, if you squint with your ears a bit, you'll be able to notice that a live orchestra is playing over it.
Honestly, I'm mixed on it, but I don't hate it. The visuals have also been polished up a bit too, and while I'm partial to the original models, DX The Conspiracy has a full set of updated higher poly models for the NPCs, as well as mocapped animations and updated sounds, not to mention the lean feature being surprisingly well implemented into the controller. Holding L2 will let you lean left and right, but then your crosshair with the right stick becomes a free roaming cursor that can move around the screen as if you're playing Metroid Prime on the Wii. It's a bit slow, sure, but it's an interesting mechanic that I actually enjoy a lot. I couldn't think of a way to properly segue into this, but the controller also rumbles when a large NPC walks by, which is more of a gimmicky feature than it is a benefit, but I won't lie, I thought it was pretty cool when it kicked in. Unfortunately, that's about all I have to say for DX The Conspiracy right now. I only played up to the first visit to Unatco headquarters, which honestly caught me a bit off guard. Most of the headquarters are still intact, a single map that didn't take any compromises. But oh god, some of these models. Jaime looks like a completely different person, and Manderly? Manderly looks like he's seen God. I might stream a full playthrough of this over on my Twitch, so hey, make sure you're following me. Twitch.tv forward slash TrevGuyTV, as well as my Twitter for updates regarding my Twitch. Now alright, what if you wanted to play an updated version of Deus Ex without wanting to deal with all the system jank of the PS2 reimagining? Honestly, I think your best bet is going to be Deus Ex the Revision mod, and brace yourself, this one's a bit divisive. Thankfully, it's free though, available on Steam as an easy to install mod, though it's apparent by these screenshots that the mod is going for spectacle more than anything. It gives off a really great first impression, but I feel like the quality of each map plummets the further you play. But I do think that it is worth your time if you're really itching for an additional playthrough of the game, but for the love of god, do not make this your first. I'm not really sure what else there really is to say about this mod, I just wanted to bring it up because I know that someone would ask me about it in the comments if I didn't. I've beaten it before, and I thought it was just okay at the time, but it's been a while and it has been updated since, maybe I'll stream this one too someday. But yes, Deus Ex has mods. The most popular being ones that offer some quality of life changes. The infamous Shifter and its expansion bio mod are great for future playthroughs, with its upgraded enemy AI, new weapons, somewhat randomized weapon drops making each playthrough a little bit more exciting, alt fires, auto saves, athletics replacing the useless swimming augmentation, augmentations that only use up bio energy when you're using them rather than when they're toggled on and off, regen aug auto balances, <laughs> and that's just to name a few. Again, I don't recommend it for a first time playthrough, but it is a ton of fun on a revisit. But fuck it, it doesn't all have to be quality of life. Bring on the shit posting! Paul. I. I. I thought you were a Gep gun. Ladies and gentlemen, this really is the Malkavian mod. I streamed a playthrough of this a while back, and it feels like nearly every line in this mod has become an inside joke with me and my pals. Give me a chopper and friendly fire, and I'll handle it. <laughs> I'm your brother. I'm sure you understand. The Gap Gun takedown is always the most silent way to eliminate Manderly. Who are you? perfect, unstable solution. Why are you locked in the bathroom? You talking to me? Maybe you should try getting a job. Lucius De Beer says you've got five seconds to tell me who you work for. One. Madre de Dios! Two. <laughs> got him! One of the guys kidnapped me. I was ordered to knock out private security for a biotech company or something. Pussycats. 250. I'm looking for the box down here. The junkies found a box the other day. The junkies? One time I was drunk and fell asleep and they put me on the train tracks. My dad used to say, slaughter, slaughter, slaughter. He's dead. I like that. Manderly raps. Get moving. Get, get moving. That and Deus Ex the Recut, God, I've, I love both of these so much. Why contain it? It's cool. Yep, I named my beggar's bazooka after that shitty joke. Old men. Warning. Warning. But what about total conversions, I hear you hypothetically asking? Well, the mod scene has you covered there too. Allow me to introduce you to the Nameless mod, an entire campaign with multiple pathways and playthroughs entirely based on the Deus Ex forums of GameSpy, rest in peace. Now look, I'll be honest, I can't exactly tell you what makes this mod so great since I haven't found the time to do a full playthrough of it. But that doesn't undermine how massive it was in the modding scene, even grabbing the attention of Eidos Montreal, who gave the team exclusive screenshots of the then upcoming Deus Ex 3 Human Revolution to hide in the mod as an easter egg. But if it's a full and proper sequel to the original that you're looking for... Welcome Alex, I see that you're awake. Just trying to sleep off the chopper ride. What happened? <laughs> oh god.